All right, so hopefully you can see that. Um, all right, so I think you know one of the things that's been particularly exciting over the fast, last few years um, are tremendous advances in single cell technology, um, but in particular, beyond the ability to measure just the transcriptome uh, and the ability to measure all sorts of, of uh, different modalities um, uh, and different types of, of molecular measurements within a single cell. Um, I think also many of these technologies, for example, single cell attack seek, which measures chromatin accessibility, or site seek, which measures protein, or even spatial technologies, um, all of these other types of information are very complementary uh, to the transcriptome. The transcriptome is great as a sort of initial description um, for what a cell is doing and what genes it's expressing, um, but all of these other uh, types of data really can help us understand the deeper biology of a cell, how it's being regulated, uh, who it's interacting with. Um, and so all of these types of measurements um, offer a unique and complementary perspective uh, of a cell's behavior. And so that raises a really uh, interesting and fascinating series of computational questions um, for how we can take all of these different data types um, and learn jointly across them. Instead of analyzing just one data type or one modality at a time, how can we analyze them together? And that's an interesting problem, both for multimodal technologies, where we can measure multiple data types together in the same cell simultaneously, but also for cases where we can't measure everything together, we have to collect data sets from different experiments and then find ways of integrating and harmonizing those measurements. And that's what I really want to focus on today. Um, and, and I think actually that the immune system, which is where I'll focus most of my talk, is, is a really good example for, for the necessity of multimodal technologies. Um, these are a couple of UMAP plots uh, from a, a 10x genomics experiment of healthy human blood um, a few years ago, um, but also one of the, now just a couple of years old, uh, one of the first data sets of um, uh, a single cell from, from the blood of patients with COVID-19. And, and while these are very exciting data sets, um, in some ways, uh, they're a little bit disappointing because the, the T cell compartments, which we know to be some of the most heterogeneous and, and functionally diverse uh, uh, cell types in the body, just are represented as some of these kind of large blobs um, in the single cell RNA-seq analysis. Um, and that tells us that the transcriptome uh, is insufficient for being able to fully capture and describe uh, the diversity that we know is present within the T cell compartment. And, and it's actually kind of a shame because we, if we just had access to a few surface proteins, um, we, we would be able to delineate many additional subsets, for example, memory and effective and a regulatory and gamma delta uh, subsets of T cells, um, which we cannot see just by looking at the transcriptome alone. Um, and so that was a, a challenge that we've been thinking about for a while, and in, in particular caught the eye of, of Peter Smybert and Marlon Stoikis, who are, who are some of my closest collaborators here at NYGC. And they realized that if you stain cells with antibodies that were conjugated to uh, barcoded DNA oligos, and those oligos had a poly A site um, that could be used uh, as a capture sequence, um, we could effectively convert protein levels into something that we could read out alongside single cell RNA-seq data. Um, and this is a technology known as SiteSeq. We published this a few years ago, and, and many of you are familiar with it. Um, and if you are familiar with SiteSeq, then you know um, that when you run these experiments, you don't just recover transcript levels for single cell RNA-seq, you recover levels of surface protein expression as well in the same cells at the same time. Um, so it's, it's really multimodal data. Um, and I want to highlight a couple of things about SiteSeq data. The first, uh, especially the protein information, um, the first is, is the data is really like facts. Um, you can trust that a T cell, for example, uh, really is a T cell um, because you detect CD3 protein. Um, you would never do that from single cell RNA-seq. The data is much too noisy to, to, to place any particular emphasis on one measurement or one gene, um, but the protein data is, is far more robust. And the other thing that I want to point out is that we can really scale the number of antibodies when we do site seq. We're not limited by overlap and sort of fluorescent signal. We can measure the level of hundreds uh, of antibodies together um, all alongside the transcriptome. And I'll, I'll show you uh, that, that data later in the talk. Um, so this, this uh, the first story that I'll tell you about, I uh, was first on bioarchive and was published um, earlier last year. Um, as a, uh, uh, and you know, I, I really want to highlight uh, this. This has been a close collaboration uh, with the Technology Innovation Lab, um, and also led by by a few very talented people in my lab, including uh, Yuhan Hao and and, and Shui Zhang. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, some collaborators in the University of Washington and Fred Hutch, um, in particular, Catherine Blish, uh, Julia McElrath, and Rafael Gattardo, who provided samples and, and incredible immunology expertise um, over the course of this project. All right, so what really the, the goal here is to think about new technologies and, and sorry, new computational methods to be able to analyze site seek data. And let me give you a, a simple example first. Um, this is the first site seek data set we ever published. It's about 8,500 immune cells, um, and we measured 13 different surface proteins because we had 13 antibodies. Um, and what's really cool about SiteSeq, as, as I said, is we have RNA and protein at the same time. So we really have sort of two expression matrices and, and the columns are the same because we're measuring these, these modalities in the same cells. 
Um, and you can see viscerally just by looking at these matrices how different uh, the data is. Um, the RNA data has the benefit of being transcriptome wide. We're measuring thousands of genes, um, but it's very, very sparse data. Uh, the protein information um, has quite a lot of background uh, for sure, um, but there, there's no dropout. Uh, you don't have these extensive zeros throughout the matrix, and, and that's because uh, there's a much higher copy number of proteins compared to mRNA molecules per cell, um, so the data is substantially more robust. But on the downside, the protein measurements are a targeted assay. We only had 13 antibodies, and there are probably cell types in our data set where we didn't include any specific protein markers. Um, so we're limited by the antibodies that we put in. And, and so each data type you know, kind of has its, its own strengths and weaknesses. You can either go very broad um, and untargeted, but noisy like an RNA, um, or a more limited set of markers, uh, but with much more robust data, like just the protein information. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about how to analyze these data sets together, and, and we can start uh, just by, by analyzing the modalities independently. Um, so what if we just analyze the RNA and protein on their own? That's what I'm showing you here. Um, and you can see that we get very largely um, consistent results, um, which is quite comforting, that generally the same populations emerge, um, but there are some important differences. So in the RNA data, for example, uh, CD4 and CD8 cells sort of blend together, like I showed you before. They're very, they're very challenging to distinguish, um, but the separation is, is extremely clear um, in the protein data. Uh, that's not particularly surprising because we have access to CD4 and CD8 protein measurements um, in the protein data. Um, however, uh, if we just look at protein, we lose certain cell types, um, including red blood cell progenitors um, and dendritic cells. Uh, they blend into other cell types because we, our antibody panel did not include any markers that were specific for those cell populations. Um, so what that tells us is that neither of these data types perfectly encapsulates um, the entirety of the system, um, but we need some way of being able to quantify this um, and, and some way of being able to overcome this challenge. So the strategy that I'm going to tell you about today is, is we're going to predict the molecular contents of each cell um, from its neighbors. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So for example, the target cell um, in, in this slide is, is uh, marked in blue here. It's the same cell in both RNA and protein space. Uh, and, and you can see the cell has a series of, of RNA neighbors, cells that have similar RNA expression profiles. Those are denoted by these red dots. Um, and it's got a series of protein neighbors as well. And what we can do is we can use the neighbors, the red cells, to sort of predict the molecular contents of the blue cell, sort of a, a form of imputation. Um, and what I'm going to show you is that we can compare the predicted uh, values to the actual measurements, uh, and we can use that, that error to determine how useful or how informative um, each modality is. Um, so one thing that I want, to note, I want you to notice before I show you more detail, in protein space, all the neighbors of this cell are CD8 T cells, which is good. In RNA space, though, things are more uncertain. The neighbors are a mixture of CD4 and CD8 T cells, and that's going to mess up um, the accuracy of, of imputation when we average these things together. Um, all right, so I'm showing you here an example with CD8 protein. Um, each dot is a cell, um, and we're comparing the measured expression um, with the predicted values um, from the neighbors. Um, so if we use protein neighbors, uh, we can see an extremely high correlation. Um, that tells us that the protein data is really quite informative um, for classifying whether or not a cell is a CD8 T cell. Um, for RNA data, we can see that the neighbors do a reasonable job of prediction. There's a pretty good correlation, but there are a subset of cells um, where we see substantial error. And these are exactly the cells where the RNA data was insufficient to, to, to describe um, the cell identity. And in fact, the RNA data caused CD4 and CD8 T cells to mix together within a local neighborhood. So since that we, we can see there's an error there, and that tells us that for these cells, the RNA data is insufficient. It's less useful to define the state of the cell. So we had the idea that for those specific cells, maybe we should increase the weight that we assign their, their protein information um, in the downstream analysis. Um, and I'm not showing you this for time, but of course, there are also examples for cells where the RNA data is more informative, and we feel that we need to increase their RNA weight uh, in the downstream analysis. Um, so that's, that's our goal, is to be able to define for each cell the relative importance or contribution of each modality. And we call this process weighted nearest neighbor analysis. Um, there's a lot of, there's a fair amount of math here. I'm going to skip over most of the details as they're fully described in the manuscript, but I will summarize the key steps. Uh, first, we want to construct K nearest neighbor graphs, and we construct those separately um, for each individual modality, uh, RNA and protein. Uh, next, we use the neighbors identified in these graphs to predict a cell's expression value um, for each gene and for each protein. Uh, and then we, can, we calculate the accuracy or the affinities between the predicted and the actual values. Uh, and then finally, we can convert those affinities uh, into modality weights. Um, so in this case, each cell is going to get an RNA weight and a protein weight 
and they're going to sum together to one. Now, by the way, once we have these weights, we can now construct a new distance metric that can relate any two cells in the data set. The distance between cells I and J is going to be a weighted average of their distance in RNA space and their distance in protein space. And those weights are going to, those are going to come exactly from these modality weights that we've learned. And so this weighted distance measure um, will uh, capture information from both modalities in a single analysis, um, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, so I think it's useful to actually look at these weights and, and kind of explore them. It's, it's fun to look at. And, and uh, as a reminder, each cell, gets a, uh, each cell gets a different RNA modality weight, a different protein modality weight, but they must sum within a cell to one. Um, and so what we can see here in this analysis is that most cells, their RNA modality weight is, is about 50%. So the RNA protein balance is about 50-50, which makes sense uh, with the UMAP plots that I showed you earlier. But for some CDAT cells, um, we have very, very low modality weights, and as a result, very high protein weights. And again, those are the cells where the single cell RNA-seq data was insufficient to define cellular state. And our method tells us that the protein data is essential and should be given more influence. On the flip side, dendritic cells have an almost 100% RNA weight, and that makes sense. That was one of the cell types where we didn't have any protein markers in our analysis. Um, so those, in those cells, the protein data is insufficient, and the RNA data is essential. Um, and so uh, we, we learned these in an unsupervised way, and now this is going to enable us to combine uh, the modalities together um, using our weighted average just distance measure. We can use that distance measure for all downstream analysis, including, for example, UMAP visualization or clustering. Um, so you can see here on the, on the left um, is a single representation, which we call the weighted nearest neighbor representation, um, that captures information from both modalities and reflects a weighted combination of RNA and protein measurements. Um, we hope that this WNN representation does reflect the richness of both data types in a single analysis, and I, I think here that it does. Um, you can see that we really do get the best of both worlds. Um, we can perfectly separate uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells. Before, we could only do that when analyzing the protein data. But we also recover our dendritic cells, our red blood cell progenitors, which before we could only do when analyzing our RNA data. Um, and so that's really the point that I want to get across here is that we can, by using these weights, um, we can integrate these two modalities together um, and capture information uh, that's present in both of them. So this is just a very basic example, just uh, with a, a very small antibody panel. I want to show you um, a couple more, uh, uh, more exciting biological examples for what we can do um, with this sort of approach. So the second uh, site CDA set that my, my group published is a lot more interesting. It's from the human bone marrow. Um, so we have a lot more cells, and, and now we have 25 different antibodies. Um, so for those of you that work on bone marrow, you know that it, it encapsulates both early um, hematopoietic progenitors, but also differentiated immune cells. Um, but actually, in this case, when we did the experiment, it was actually sort of an oversight. When we designed a protein panel, we only included antibodies um, that were specific to different populations of differentiated cells. We didn't include antibodies for any progenitor states like hematopoietic stem cells or myeloid progenitors. Um, so that, that actually became an, sort of an interesting uh, and important test of our method. And I'll just say that if you're interested in exploring or trying out this approach, um, you can, you can do, uh, go through our kind of uh, vignettes and, and tutorials um, for weighted nearest neighbor analysis on, on my lab website for this data set. Um, so again, we can see that here that the weighted nearest neighbor analysis does the best job of being able to separate both progenitors and differentiated immune cells. And we can explore why that is, again, by looking at our uh, cell weights. Um, so if we look at the populations that have the highest protein modality weight, you can see that all of these different populations are different populations of T cells. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. As I've shown you before, um, uh, RNA data is typically insufficient to be able to define T cell state. That's because those cells are very small, they have low RNA content, um, and they have very strong surface markers that delineate their functional diversity. Um, so it's great that it's, it's good that the algorithm picks up on that and, and assigns them a high protein modality weight. On the other hand, if we look for populations that have a uh, very low protein modality weight and are defined pr primarily by RNA, we see that all of these populations are early hematopoietic progenitors. And again, that makes sense because those were the cell populations, but we didn't include uh, protein markers in our antibody panel. So the reason that I'm, I'm really highlighting this point is, is we feel that it's very important when you start doing multimodal analysis, we have lots and lots of different data types. Uh, flexibility is, is, we think, really essential. Um, not every data type is going to contribute equally to down stream analysis, and the relative contribution for each data type may vary from cell to cell. Um, in the context of site seek, that's going to depend on what antibodies you add. It's going to depend on how deeply you sequence. It's going to depend on what your sample is. Um, there's no way of knowing necessarily in advance how important each modality is going to be. And so the ability to learn those weights in an unsupervised fashion, uh, we believe, is important. 
Um, I just want to highlight, I, I'm going to show most of the examples from SiteSeq um, in this in this uh, talk, but uh, way the nearest neighbor analysis can apply to any sort of multimodal data. We've been seeing it used in the community um, for many different data types. Um, for example, uh, some of you are familiar with the 10x multiome kit where you can sequence um, RNA and ataxic simultaneously uh, in the same cell. So again, that's a multimodal measurement. Um, we can apply a way the nearest neighbor analysis in that context as well. Um, and again, it works, works quite nicely. Again, you can uh, go through this analysis if you'd like on my lab website. Um, and we find that that way to nearest uh, neighbor analysis does well uh, when, when analyzing multi ion data as well. Uh, again, uh, also within T cells, um, where we, we find that in addition to transcriptomic information, the chromatin accessibility can really help to be able to functionally uh, to, to be able to separate um, and identify different populations of T cells. Um, so I'll, I'll switch back to, to kind of SiteSeq. And as I mentioned at the beginning, one real advantage of SiteSeq is that we're not limited in the number of antibodies that we're measuring um, anymore. And so we've been working in collaboration with BioLegend in order to build a big, as big of an antibody panel as we possibly can. Um, and we basically generated a data set that consists of a couple hundred thousand uh, human white blood cells. Um, and in each uh, cell, we measure the transcriptome um, and also 228 antibodies simultaneously. Uh, for a subset of cells, we also measure um, uh, TCR and, and BCR sequences as part of the 10x5 prime kit. So our goal here um, really is to construct a, a multimodal reference atlas um, of the human immune system. So uh, all, all of this data has been, been released openly as part of the publication. We have portals and, and uh, ways to visualize and explore this data, but I'm just showing you kind of the, the, the overall results here, which I think are, are quite, quite beautiful and high resolution. Um, and I think that's really because the 228 um, antibody measurements uh, inside each cell really inject a, a huge amount of information um, into the analysis um, and our way to nearest neighbor approach uh, picks up on that. Um, and as a result, we don't see blobs of CD4 and, and CD8 T cells anymore. We see incredible uh, structure and heterogeneity. Um, very conservatively, we called uh, more than 30 different clusters of T cells. These include uh, not only memory and naive and effector subsets, but also regulatory subsets, uh, gamma delta T cells, uh, mucosal associated invariant T cells, uh, double negative T cells, uh, really incredible uh, T cell diversity that we simply had never been able to see when exploring single cell RNA-seq data alone. And I really do want to emphasize, we were, we were stunned uh, when we saw this, just how much information um, we're missing just by relying on unsupervised clustering of, of single cell RNA-seq. And, and that was very exciting to us. Um, you can read about some of the, the more kind of biological results in, in, in the manuscript. I'll just mention very briefly a few things we were excited about. Um, within CD8 um, uh, memory cells, we observe very strong bimodality in the expression of integrin proteins, for example, CD49A and CD103. What was exciting about that is that those proteins have typ typically been associated with tissue resident memory cells um, that, that are present in tissues. Um, but of course, these cells were present in circulating cells in the blood. Um, and so that may, in fact, represent um, kind of an early sign that those cells are preparing to leave circulation um, and, and uh, enter, uh, enter individual tissues. Um, we also identified uh, a gradient um, within NK cells um, that, that had not been previously characterized, at least genomically, um, that we think uh, may correspond to sort of an adaptive-like um, NK cell state and is defined by uh, very, very clean, uh, very strongly expressed protein markers as well, like CD38. Um, and finally, uh, as I mentioned, we had a subset of cells where we had also measured uh, T cell repertoires and, and their, their uh, uh, T cell receptor sequence. Um, and that enabled us to look at different clones um, and to be able to look at transcriptomic and proteomic heterogeneity um, for cells in the same clone. Um, and we actually see that cells within the same clone um, uh, have very, very similar molecular states, um, uh, uh, both for, for kind of canonical populations like mucosal associated and variant T cells, um, but also within other cytotoxic populations as well. All right, so you know, hopefully um, I've, I've convinced you that we can add some information uh, to, to analysis by instead of just measuring RNA alone, by also measuring protein. And if you're, if you're doing an experiment where you're looking at blood cells or immune cells, we strongly encourage you um, to perform SiteSeq um, uh, in addition uh, to, to single cell RNA-seq profiling. Um, but what if, what if you can't do SiteSeq? Um, what if you already have, for example, an, an exciting single cell RNA-seq data set, but there's no protein measured? So, so for example, uh, as I said, this is a data set um, that was published, um, one of the first data sets uh, from the blood of COVID-19 patients. Um, but it was only done with single cell RNA-seq. There, there were no protein measurements. Uh, and, and it's a very exciting data set, but the resolution that they see within lymphoid cells um, is much lower um, than what we identify um, in our SiteSeq atlas. So we wonder whether there might be a way um, to use our atlas in a supervised way to help us interpret uh, or, or better understand um, the single cell RNA-seq data set. Uh, even in the in the absence of protein information. Um, so I'll, I'll show you how we did that. And I, I want to introduce an idea uh, known as sufficient dimensionality reduction. 
Um, so I'll, I'll try to go through this in some detail, but again, it's, it's described better in the manuscript. But, but suppose for a multimodal data set, um, we have, of course, RNA and protein together. I'm going to call that Y. Okay. Um, but of course, we could just pretend that we forgot the protein information and just call the RNA information uh, alone X. Uh, now, obviously, X and Y are not independent. Um, if we know the transcriptome, we, we have a pretty good guess at the, the protein as well. But the goal is that we want to identify some sort of transformation of the RNA data so that if we apply that transformation, we'll call that transformation U, if we apply that transformation, then uh, the X and Y will be conditionally independent given this transformation. That's our goal. So basically, we want to find some transformation of the RNA data that captures as much as possible all of the information in the multimodal data set. And our hypothesis is that, that this transformation is going to be better than something like PCA. And in fact, this is a, a technique called supervised PCA. Um, and it turns out we can find a, a solution to this problem uh, by performing optimization based on the Hilbert-Schmidt independence criteria. It's basically a way that we can measure the dependence between two random variables uh, and can be expressed in terms of kernel functions. Um, so K is a, the kernel function of, of U, uh, which is what we're, what, which is what is unknown, so we're trying to find. Um, L is a kernel for the multimodal data set. That's our weighted nearest neighbor graph. Um, and it turns out that there's a closed form um, solution to this, which we can even compute efficiently. And it returns an orthogonal subspace that represents a linear transformation that we can project single cell RNA-seq data into a low dimensional space. So that sounds very similar to PCA. And in fact, this, this problem is similar to PCA. But when we run PCA, we're just trying to find any source of variance in the data set in a completely unsupervised way. So that source of variance may correspond to different cell types in the data. It may correspond to cell cycle. It may correspond to technical noise. It may correspond to batch effects. It's just going to be sources of variance. But when we run supervised PCA, we're specifically going to highlight sources of variance that help to explain the weighted nearest neighbor graph. So it's sources of variance that help to separate our multimodally defined cell types. Um, and, and so that, that we believe and we, we show um, substantially outperforms PCA in terms of our ability to, to interpret um, and, and, and project single cell RNA-seq data sets because we can apply this transformation um, to any single cell RNA-seq data set, even if there was no protein that was measured. So that was our challenge. Our challenge was to, pro to, uh, to project a single cell RNA-seq data set um, onto our site-seq reference, and that's exactly what we can do now. I'm showing you the same uh, data set on the left and the right. On the left is an unsupervised analysis. On the right is what happens when we map that same data um, onto our reference. And what you can see now is when we do map the, those cells onto our reference, we really can start to recapitulate the same level of resolution um, that we had previously observed by a site seq. So now we can annotate populations of regulatory T cells, mucosal associated invariant T cells, gamma delta uh, C cells, multiple populations of memory, effector, B and NK cells, um, all through this reference mapping. And, and the other thing that's nice about this is it's, it's really quite fast. Um, the whole analysis from, from the raw data takes you know, a couple of minutes, um, and, and that's because we've already identified the best transformation, and now we can just rapidly apply it um, to new query data sets. Um, the other thing that's nice about this reference mapping is, is it really projects multiple data sets now into the same uniform and, and harmonized space, which makes it very easy to do downstream comparisons. So now we can take our map data set and we can divide it to look at cells from COVID patients and also cells from healthy controls. And that makes it very easy for us to look for each cell type, what's the difference in cellular abundance, and also are there changes in, in expression. Um, but since everything's been mapped, that, that's very easy to do, and, and that's very powerful for doing comparisons. So for example, um, we can, we can uh, look for big differences in uh, cell abundance. You can already start to see some visually. Um, we can validate a couple of results in the original manuscript where we can see a increase in plasma blasts and a decrease in plasma citrogenetic cells in COVID patients. But we can also see a dramatic increase in mucosal associated invariant T cells, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, a decrease in COVID patients. Um, that was not something that we had previously observed um, in unsupervised analysis because this population blended in with other T cell subsets, but we can see it very clearly um, with supervised annotation. Um, and it turns out we can validate this result very nicely um, with CITOF and other uh, independent technologies, and, and it's now been validated by a number of uh, independent groups in the literature as well. Um, so it's a nice example of how reference mapping and annotation um, can really be used not for discovering new cell types, but once you've discovered those cell types to help annotate them and, and describe them um, in new samples. Um, so with this goal in mind, we, we've actually uh, built a, a web tool called Azimuth, um, which you can use and, and just upload your own. It's kind of like Blast for, for cells. Um, you can just take your data, upload it uh, as a counts matrix, um, and then our web server um, will automatically, often in, in, a, in a minute or even less, uh, map it uh, to one of our references 
um, uh, assign cellular annotations uh, and perform visualization, annotation, and differential expression. Um, so we currently have um, eight different references that are available as part of the Human Biomolecular Atlas project. Um, I encourage you to check this out and try it on, on your own data. It's, it's free to use um, at, at azimuth.hubmapconsortium.org. All right, so I'll, I'll stop this first section and, and, and remind you that, that uh, we think there are real advantages and, and opportunities for integrative and multimodal analysis. Um, for something like SiteSeq, it's, it's a nice example because each modality brings something uh, complementary to the table. The protein data is more robust uh, to dropout. It's got a higher copy number, um, but it lacks the richness of single cell RNA-seq data uh, on its own because it's a targeted assay. Um, however, weighing the modalities together uh, really helps to enable this integrative analysis and improves our ability to discover cellular phenotypes. Um, I want to highlight that this method can be used for any type of multimodal data um, within single cells, um, including uh, new types of measurements that can measure chromatin and RNA simultaneously. Um, and we also released a set of tools um, to be able to construct multimodal references and map new data sets onto them to facilitate their interpretation. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll stop that first section there and, and transition uh, now to, to, a, to a slightly different but related topic. Um, and, and still focused on multimodal analysis, but, but um, uh, with a slightly different uh, viewpoint. Um, and, and the fun thing for me about this, this next section is, is it's actually really not focused on RNA. Um, most of the work that my lab is known for it relates to RNA, and we worked on that for you know, almost, almost 10 years. Um, but, but actually, this next section, it almost has nothing to do with RNA at all, which is, which is kind of fun. And, and when we do single-cell RNA-seq, we often think about the goal of that technology to be able to discover uh, new cellular populations. And that is, of course, something we can do. Um, but another way of looking at that technology is that what we're really learning is, is we're learning something about our genes. We're learning patterns of genes that can be biologically co-expressed and patterns of genes that cannot be biologically co-expressed. So we're learning something about the regulation of genes um, in, in, within human cells. Um, so when we do something like single cell attack seq, where we measure chromatin accessibility, we can think of the same kind of paradigm. We can use single cell attack seq to discover cells, but we can also use single cell attack seq to learn something about our genomes and to learn something about which parts of our genome are important um, and which parts of our genomes are playing functionally important roles. Um, and that's really going to be the, the focus of this next section. Um, but again, that, that word function, when we want to think about the function of, of DNA elements, that's a really exciting challenge, um, but, but quite, a, quite a, 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 a difficult one, uh, because we have to think about really what function means and how can we study the function of DNA elements. And I would argue that attack seek while exciting, uh, it, it tells us something about the open and closed nature of chromatin, but it doesn't really tell us much about function. Something that does tell us a lot about function, however, are modifications to the tails of histone proteins. So, so many, of, if not all of you are familiar with the histone code hypothesis, which states that a combination of chemical modifications that are present on the tails of histone proteins correlates with the function of surrounding DNA elements. So for example, the presence of the H3K4 ME3 modification may indicate a functional promoter, while the presence of a K27ME3 modification might indicate a functional repressor. And the idea is that there's a whole suite of these marks, and, and the idea is that not just one of them on their own, but a combination of them together um, can help us to decode and understand genome function. And that, that's really exciting. Um, and that's typically measured um, with something like ChIP-seq. Um, but as you probably know, ChIP-seq is not something that, that scales particularly well um, to, to single cells. Um, so if we want to uh, study the function of DNA elements within single cells, um, we really need new technologies. Um, and I, I want to propose a, a wish list um, for, for single cell profiling. If I could propose any modify, any technology that, that, that I, I could have, um, it would look something like this. And, and I've named it single cell DNA, DNA seq because this technology uh, does not exist. Um, it did not exist previously. It's not what I'm going to show you now. It, it's really a wish list for a hypothetical world, but it's, it's a helpful thing to think through. So if we could do any, uh, invent any technology, I would love this technology to be able to simultaneously profile the genomic locations of multiple histone modifications in the same sample. I would like that technology to be able to scale down to, to very small samples, even down to single cell resolution. Um, and while we're wishing for things, I'd, I'd love to be able to measure all sorts of other things at the same time, um, RNA transcriptomes, uh, protein abundances, everything all together within single cells. Now, if we could do this, and I think I've been clear that we cannot, um, but if we could, it would be quite fun because it would enable us to define a functional role for each segment of DNA based on the combinatorial patterns of multiple histone marks in each cell. So we could explore the functional variability of the same DNA segment across single cells. We could identify how DNA or motif elements, uh, uh, we could identify uh, DNA or motif elements that correlate um, with specific DNA functions and specific cell types. 
Um, and we could also understand how different modalities correlate with each other. How do changes in genome organization and function correlate with changes in gene expression? Um, so, so that's, as again, that's, that's, a, that's a wish list and, and it's not something we've been able to do, um, but I want to tell you about uh, something we have developed that I think meets many of the same criteria and allows us to pursue the same analytical goals that we had hoped to achieve. Um, so this is work that's been led by, by two postdocs in the lab, uh, Bing Ji Zhang, who's led all the experimental work, and, and Avi Sirstava, who's led all the analysis. Um, and the technology really leverages a diverse set of advantages from uh, uh, advances from across the single cell community. Um, and I want to highlight a few of those and, and show you now how we've put them together. So the first advance um, is a technology called Cut and Tag from Steve Henikoff's lab. And if you're not familiar with Cut and Tag, uh, you certainly will be soon. I, I think it's really starting to, to take off in the community in the same way that a tax seek is, is starting to take off with regards to DNA's hypersensitivity. Cut and Tag will start to, to replace chip seek as well. Um, so basically with, with Cut and Tag, you fuse the TNA, TN5 transposes to, to protein A, and protein A likes to bind antibodies. Um, so if your genome is stained with antibodies against kk 4 me 3 then the transposase will be targeted not to regions of open chromatin, like in a taxi, but to regions that are bound by k 4 me 3 like in chip seek. So it's, it's a method of profiling and sequencing protein DNA interactions, but because it still uses the TN5 transposase for fragmentation and adapter insertion, it's extremely efficient and it's compatible with low input samples and also single cells. Um, and so in fact, the, the Hennikoff lab and, and others have, have demonstrated that you can generate cut and tag profiles from single cells using the 10X Genomics single cell ataxy kit. Uh, you can do these for one mark at a time. Um, and you can see here a, a, another lab, the Gonzalo Casella Broncos lab in the mouse brain was able to cluster and annotate broad cell types um, in multiple experiments based on single cell cut and tag profiles um, for different um, histone modifications. So that's really exciting because it enables us to move beyond the open and closed binarization of ataxy data. So here in this locus, you can see regions that are marked by repressive um, H3K27 ME3, um, but there are also promoter regions marked by H3K4 ME3. There are active enhancers, actively transcribed regions. Um, so, so it really moves beyond kind of the open and closed paradigm of, of a tax seek. And, and this is uh, really an exciting advance. But there are two very significant limitations. The first is that cut and tag data is very sparse. It's even more sparse than single cell attack seek. You know, sometimes we're measuring just a few hundred uh, individual fragments per cell and a genome that's got millions and, and billions of bases. So, you know, it's really not very ideal for defining cell types uh, by unsupervised clustering. Um, but perhaps more importantly, um, single cell cut and tag, it, it's challenging to, if not impossible, to actually measure multiple marks in the same cell at the same time. Um, for many reasons, in, in fact, just because the, the marks would sort of cannibalize each other across uh, multiple experiments. Um, but we don't want to measure marks one at a time. We want to use combinations of histone marks to define function. So we need a way to be able to integrate data from different experiments together. Um, but that's really quite challenging. How can you align data sets where you measure histone modifications with entirely different functions. Um, so those are real challenges computationally. Um, and so uh, our solution um, uh, is gonna leverage um, some of the same tricks uh, from, from SiteSeq. And as I showed you, SiteSeq uses DNA barcoded antibodies to convert detection of proteins into a quantitative and sequenceable readout. Now before we had used that to measure RNA and protein from the same cell, like I showed you. Um, but last year, Eleni Mimitu at the New York Genome Center realized that we could use the same trick and measure ataxy profiles and protein levels all in the same cell. So they introduced a technology called ASAPSeq, um, which, is, which is now out, um, and that uses a 10x uh, genomics ataxy kit um, to be able to measure um, uh, ataxy and surface proteins uh, in the same cell. And I'll just highlight that one of the really key advances there was the ability to perform ataxy on whole cells rather than whole nuclei, because of course you need to keep the cellular membrane to be able to measure um, surface proteins. Um, so that, that's a good summary of what some of the really key advances have been um, by other groups. But once Eleni introduced ASAPSeq, uh, Bing Ji and my lab started to see if we could further motive modify the protocol to get it not to work not with a tax seek and open chromatin measurements, but instead with cut and tag. And now we arrive at the technology that I'll tell you about today called single cell cut and tag pro. So the way this works is that we stain cells with antibodies, both against the target of interest. So for example, uh, anti H3K4 ME3 so to measure the location of that modification, but also a panel of cell surface proteins like we do with SiteSeq. Then we tagment TN5, uh, DNA with the TN5 protein A fusion, uh, and we run the 10X single cell ataxy kit with optimized conditions to run on whole cells. So basically we're able to measure single cell cut and tag profiles. 
So you know, there's a lot of optimization that's essential here. We have to get the right buffers, the right conditions to work to be able to, to, uh, to get a low background for cut and tag and also get high quality protein data. But in the end, we generate multimodal data where in each cell, we generate a, a single cell cut and tag profile for one of the histone modifications. And also we measure surface protein levels for a hundred or a couple hundred antibodies in the same cell at the same time. Um, so all that data I'm going to show you today uh, is going to be from a human PEMC. All right, so I'm showing you some data here. Uh, these are from three independent experiments where you did uh, single cell cut and tag pro for H3K4ME1, H3K27ME3, and H3K9ME3. So they're just three examples of the marks that we profiled. Um, and I'm showing you independent clustering for each modality. And the first thing that you can see is that the protein data is, is really important and, and clearly essential for getting you know, good cellular clustering. Um, on the bottom, we're clustering cells based on the cut and tag profiles. And it's actually not terrible given, given the sparsity. Uh, the cells are colored by the labels uh, that we, we uh, derive from the protein-based clustering. But you can see that, that many, many cell populations are blurring and blending together um, on the basis of cut and tag profiles. And, and that kind of makes sense. You know, for example, H3K9 ME3 defines heterochromatic regions, and, and maybe those regions don't very much, don't vary very much across closely related cell types. Um, but of course, thankfully, we have this protein data, um, which enables us to identify and, and annotate these cell types um, consistently. Um, so the protein data is, is essential for a couple of reasons. And, and, and um, you know, uh, one of the other real advantages of the protein data is that it's going to help us to integrate all of these different experiments together. Um, so I, I showed you, for example, our ability to project query data sets onto our multimodal reference um, with this tool called Azimuth. We can perform exactly the same trick here because we now have many, many different experiments. We have SiteSeq, where we've measured RNA and protein. We have, for example, from Mulaney's paper, we have ASAP-Seq, where you've measured probe and accessibility of protein. And then we have all these different single cell cut and tag experiments where we've measured a single cell cut and tag histone modification and protein. But in all of these different experiments, despite the fact that there are many different technologies, we always measure the same panel of surface proteins. And that, that shared measurement is going to enable us to very seamlessly integrate all these data sets together and, in fact, to project them onto the reference that I previously described to you. And so what I'm showing you here now is a single analysis that takes all of the data from this talk, not only our SiteSeq data, not only our ASAPC data, but all of our single cell cut and tag pro measurements across six different histone, uh, uh, six, six different histone modifications and projects them in, into a single analysis um, using the shared protein information. And so that enables us to visualize everything um, in a single manifold. It also enables us to identify a common and consistent harmonized set of cell annotations across all of these different experiments alone. So this would be at a very high granularity. This would be difficult and basically impossible to do if we only had um, one modality measured at one time. But because we have multimodal data and we have these kind of shared protein measurements, um, it enables us to, to sort of seamlessly integrate all these different experiments together. Um, so we can kind of pretend um, that we've measured all of these different modalities together. In fact, here there's 10 or nine different molecular modalities. We didn't measure them all in the same cells. We measured them in different experiments using different technologies. But because we've been able to integrate them together, it's kind of the next best thing. I, I do think that's very exciting. So in fact, we call the um, single cell megaomic profiles. Um, in each cell, we can impute or, or, or basically predict um, with high accuracy um, the uh, interpolated levels of, of 10 different molecular modalities from RNA, protein, chromatin accessibility, uh, and the, the binding profiles of all the, the modifications, all in the same cells, all at the same time. It's a different uh, integrated together. All right, so, so now we can go back and check, you know, does this, this procedure actually work? And, and, and what I'm showing you here now, uh, just as a sanity check, uh, on the top, uh, our, our chip for the H3K27 installation mark is measured by the ENCODE project. On the bottom are the same tracks uh, as measured by Single Cell Cut and Tag Pro. Of course, when ENCODE did these experiments, um, it sorted different populations of cells using facts and then ran bulk, cut and tag, bulk chip seek experiments. What we did is we ran single cell uh, cut and tag pro experiments, defined cellular populations based on protein state, and then constructed pseudobulk profiles. But you can see that things look basically identical. Um, and, and in a single uh, experiment, we're able to, to uh, learn all of the, these, these tracks um, for all of these populations. But of course, we don't have this just for H3K27 acetylation. We have this for all of our uh, different molecular modalities together. So it's kind of it's kind of fun um, to look at all of this data and, and for a locus, for example, together. When you hear the, the CD8, um, we have, uh, 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 for example, you, you can see that the CD8 is going to be um, specifically um, in CD8 
cells, both at the RNA and protein level. So that's not surprising. But now we can look at these other modalities as well. We can see that this uh, locus is uniquely accessible um, within CD8 T cells as well by a taxic. Um, you can also see enhancer marks um, that are specific, but only present in T cells, um, and also promoter marks um, that are specific, uh, activating marks um, in this population as well. All of the other cell types, like dendritic cells and monocytes and B cells, um, at this locus, they exhibit the impressive h 27 me 3 mark. Um, so again, it's, it's fun to be able to see all of this um, uh, together. So now that we all together, we can get back to our original problem. How can we define functional states across the genome using a combination of multiple system modifications? So define, for example, this region as an enhancer or a repressor within B cells, but not just based on histone modification, but based on everything together. And really, this is where a problem um, that, that has been extraordinary progress on, um, particularly from, from um, in, in the development of the, of the Chrome HMM tool. And the goal of Chrome HMM is really to take multiple histone modification profiles and to define functional states. And so that's what we wanted to apply uh, here. And so there, there, you know, what we what we've done is we, we've slightly extended this tool, what we call single cell Chrome HMM. And single cell Chrome HMM uh, runs in two steps, um, and I'll, I'll I'll go through them briefly. Um, the first step is actually identical to, to Chrome HMM. We want to learn a set of possible chromatin states um, that characterize uh, the the gene. Um, and and to do that, we run uh, the Baum Welsh algorithm on pseudo bulk tracks um, that were learned uh, from our data sets. Um, uh, so this part is, is run in pseudobulk. Um, it, it's meant to define sort of the different populations, uh, the different groups of chromatin states um, which might exist. And, and you can see kind of the output of this step here. These are the different states that we learn. Um, you can see that there are states that correspond to active promoters. Um, for example, we see very high levels of uh, k 4 me 3 We can see regions that correspond to active repressors, um, heterochromatic regions, um, and also enhancers defined by k 4 me one as well. Uh, the second step is to or classify um, uh, each region in each cell into one of these different states. Um, so what we're going to do is for each 200 base per window, we're going to be able to get a probable classification for each cell um, in one of the chrome HMM de defined states. And so we see um, actually how the of the genome varies um, across to our individual single cells. I really, really want to highlight that this is done at the single cell level. Um, it doesn't require predefined classification. Uh, it, it, and, and the reason we did that is we, we want this to apply in cases where cluster might be unclear, or be able, you might be analyzing a more sort of continuous process, for example, cellular differentiation, and we're responding to place cells into discrete bins. Um, but we still want to be able to do this classification, but just a single cell resolution. So, so here I'm showing the output of the, the single cell chromatin tool. This is the PAX5 locus, for example, which is, which is specifically active in B cells. And I'm showing you the uh, output of single cell chrome HMM at a 200 base per window, which is defined by this kind of orange region here. Um, so you can see that that within uh, this region, um, PAX5 uh, is, is really this region five is really in the promoter state in B cells. You see very high uh, enrichment of the H3K4 B3 mark. And so for each of the individual B cells in this plot, um, single cell chrome HMM assigns a high probability of regioning in a promoter state. Um, but if we look at all of the other cell types, um, we can see there's a very high probability of being in a repressed state as defined by the A3K27 ME3 mark. Um, we can look at a, a slightly different region in this locus. Um, this is the region now where we see high enrichment for H3K4 ME1 and H3K27 acetylation. Um, so this is in a promoter of B cells. Um, this region has a high probability of being in an enhancer mark. Um, but uh, again, in all, all the other cell types, um, this is largely in a repressive state. Um, and in fact, we can actually scan across this locus if we want. Let's see if this actually works. There should be a little bit of a movie here. Um, as we scan along this locus, we can actually see, um, again, for each cell, for two, each 200 base per window, um, what is the probabilistic classification um, as defined by single cell chrome HMM. So it really is a huge amount of data because we have, for each 200 base per window, we have a classification in each cell. Um, we're really having a kind of thinking about how to explore and analyze and interpret this data. Um, and I'll, I'll just show you kind of a couple of insights that we can derive from this. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, single cell chrome HMM, uh, does not require cell labels. Um, it, so it's well suited to, for example, understanding genome function varies across a continuous process, like a cell trajectory. Uh, so I'm showing you here a trajectory that connects um, naive to effector cells. Um, you know, we can see that kind of reconstruct that path from our single cell um, and now we can ask, how does how does chromatin state of individual genomic windows change across this transition? 
Um, one thing we were particularly interested in, you know, when we could see changes in repression, were there, were there loci where we see um, uh, that, for example, these are, these are thousands of loci here, where at the beginning uh, of the trajectory, um, cells are uh, in a repressive, highly repressive state. Um, but as cells progress through the trajectory, um, they enter a more active, uh, or, or uh, uh, the, the, the genomic window enters a more active um, activating state, either in a promote, promoter, promoting or enhancing way, um, or, or the opposite, where, where regions go from being initially activating to uh, repressive over the course of this trajectory. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that we can see this happen for thousands of genomic windows. Um, there are only about uh, a couple hundred genes which change over the course of this differentiation process, but there's thousands of, of genomic windows with extensive remodeling, so that's kind of exciting to see. Um, we can see motifs that are very strongly associated um, with this transition as well, um, which suggests, um, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, that there are key transcription factors that mediate um, these, these shifts in repression um, uh, during this transition. Um, so all that is, is kind of kind of interesting and, and neat for us, and we were particularly kind of interested at, at just kind of the widespread nature of, of chromatin remodeling, um, even in in, 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 uh, in in blood cells, not even in, in kind of progenitors, um, to, to see that, that thousands of regions were changing. Um, and, and, you know, it's still kind of early days for us in, in thinking about this, but one thing that was kind of fun for us to see was, was you know, we can cluster cells, for example, on the basis of their RNA expression, um, but we can also cluster cells based on their posterior probability of being in a repressive state um, for, for, for windows so now we're, we're clustering cells based on the repressive chromatin landscape. And what we found when we did that is that we actually get a, a very similar, in fact, nearly identical clustering um, to if we cluster cells based, based on RNA, and we, we actually see the same level of resolution. Um, and so that tells us that cells encode their identity very strongly only on what genes, on, not only on what genes they choose to express, um, but also on genes of the, re, uh, what region of the genome they choose to keep in an actively repressive state. Um, and that, you know, maybe that's not surprising to me, it is, but that was kind of an interesting insight to us that cells really do keep track of what they're repressing actively, and that, that really does encode um, their identity as well as the transcript on this. So we wrote that interesting. Okay, so, so clearly um, the repressive landscape um, encodes um, cellular identity. So what regions are being repressed? You know, what, what are the regions that are showing up here? Um, and, and some of the regions, um, you know, I've kind of shown before, um, are very consistent with, with the other modalities. So, so, for example, for the CD8 locus, as I mentioned, all of the modalities tell a very consistent story. Um, this gene is active within CD8 T cells, um, so it's also accessible and enrichment for active histone modifications. Other cell types, the gene is repressed, and so there's an enrichment of repressive histone modifications. So it's a very clean and, and consistent story. But this is actually a, a minority for what we see. Um, more often, we see cases like what I'm showing you here. Um, so these are a, a few cases where we see tremendous heterogeneity in chromatin state. Um, so for example, in, in this locus here, uh, there's very strong repression in monocytes based on the K27ME3 mark, um, and very high levels of activation based on chromatin state in other cell types. But what's interesting is that if you look at the RNA expression of this gene, despite the fact that there's tremendous chromatin heterogeneity, there's really no difference in RNA expression. In fact, these genes are basically off in all cell types. So there's a couple of interesting things here. And again, we see this over and over across the genome. Um, one is regions are not very far of single cell RNA seq because the gene is just not detected. And obviously, it doesn't vary across cell types, it's just kind of always zero. So it's not an informative region from single cell RNA seq. But clearly, from, from the perspective of chromatin experiments, um, there's a lot of information here. The other reason it's interesting, though, is that it kind of raises a, a fascinating biological question. Why is the cell going through the effort of repressing this region within monocytes when the gene was So why go through this effort of repressing it if it wasn't turned on any? Um, and that's an interesting hypothesis that maybe these differences in chromatin state aren't encoding something about the cell and its current state, but they might encoding dif be encoding differences in cellular potential. Maybe if there's some sort of future stimulus, this gene can be activated in some cell populations, but will remain repressed in other populations due to the presence of an inactive chromatin state. Um, so this is a, you know, this is really a hypothesis. We, we don't have functional evidence yet. I think it's going to be a really fun kind of question for my lab to pursue. Um, in general, we do see um, that when we see these examples, these genes are very, very lowly expressed um, across all cell types, which is, again, at least supportive of this idea of poisoning. And you see a very strong um, enrichment of sort of interesting categories in terms of uh, uh, you know, 
uh, signaling pathways and, and signaling channels and transcription factors um, that represent these sort of poised loci. Um, but again, this is just an early hypothesis and something that will be fun for us to explore. Um, so in the last minute, I just want to mention one other thing that we can do uh, now that we've kind of built this, this goal. Now we, we, we really try to build a multimodal atlas of the human immune system, not just with RNA and protein, but with all of these different values as well. And, and we wonder whether this might be able to help us interpret new data sets as well. So I showed you how we could project RNA data sets onto uh, our uh, reference using a technique that we call supervised PCA. We want to be able to do the same thing with, with any technology. So for example, this was a data set from Steve Hennikoff's lab where they just measured single cell cut and tag, no protein, just a single nucleus cut and tag for immune cells using the K27ME3 mark. Again, on supervised uh, you can only de uh, denote very, very broad cell types. Um, but if we modify our supervised PCA technique, we call the supervised LSI um, to project uh, a cut and tag set on its own. Um, now we can map that data again onto our reference. And so just like I showed you before, um, we can take uh, these low resolution annotations, um, but using supervised analysis, we can start to identify very high resolution cellular populations that we previously, previously hadn't seen. And really the intuition here is now that we know what we're looking for, now that we have a sense of, of really what populations are present, um, that substantially improves our ability to, to interpret and make sense of new data. Um, so I, I just want to end there. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting close to time and, and, and say that, you know, we're, we're really excited about how these new technologies and, and computational methods um, can help us ask biological questions. We can explore um, how chromatin modeling changes um, over a dynamic cellular transition, identify regions whose regulatory function is dynamic, and we can also identify DNA motifs and regulatory factors that may uh, drive these different transitions. Um, we become particularly interested in request and repressive chromatin, um, especially because we can see that cell state is really fully encoded based on a repressive chromatin landscape. Um, even though many of these loci are not necessarily uh, associated um, with with uh, changes in RNA, uh, and that may indicate um, substantial regulatory priming um, within a cell. Um, and lastly, we're excited to continue to construct these sort of mega omic atlases um, with many, many different cellular modalities measured together, um, which we can use um, uh, to really uh, uh, not only explore relationships between modalities, um, but also to uh, project uh, and interpret new data sets as well. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. I thank people throughout the talk. I'll thank uh, Bingji and Avi again for leading the second component. And, and really all of this work um, has represented a close collaboration over many, many years um, with the Technology Innovation Lab at the New York Genome Center. Uh, so thanks very much for listening, and, and uh, happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you, Rahul, for a great um, talk. Lots of very exciting work. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A, and if anyone else um, has one, uh, feel free to enter it while uh, Rahul answers this one. It's, uh, for your antibody tag experiment, does the type of antibody affect the logistics slash processing involved? That's a good question. So the, the type of antibody, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the type of antibody, um, uh, but, but in general, the, the, the biggest logistic is, is sort of the size of the antibody panel. So that, that might have been more your question if you have sort of just a couple of antibodies that you're looking at versus you know, a couple hundred. Um, how does that change things? And, and the answer is, is not a whole lot. Um, there are some, some slight optimizations um, for working with very large antibodies. And we list some of these on our, our website, by the way, that was set up by the Technology Innovation Lab, siteseek.com, where you can go and check out sort of um, experimental tips um, uh, and protocols for working with this technology. Um, but you know, one of the nice things about SiteSeek is it doesn't change too much whether you're working with um, you know, large antibody panels or small antibody panels. Um, working with intracellular markers versus um, extracellular markers does create um, um, some unique challenges, um, in particular um, trying to deal with background, um, potential background binding from intracellular markers. Um, there's been a variety of labs, um, at least in an hours that have worked on that problem. Uh, but, but in general, um, you know, the, once, once these antibodies are barcoded and, and put together, um, it really is a, a pretty basic standing procedure, just like it would be for flow cytometry. Um, but then in the end, we're just doing a sequencing readout instead of a, instead of a flow cytometry. Um, okay, thank you. There's another question. Um, so how many, oh, actually, I think this might be a follow-up from the previous one, and then I'll get to the next one. Um, quant quantity or from IE, IGV versus IGA, since you're doing single scales, I was wondering if that impacts things. So I think maybe what you're asking is, is how much anybody to add to the experiment. Uh, and so, yes, there, there is, 
uh, as with any, uh, whether it's chip seek or, or whether it's cut and tag, uh, you know, you, you, there, there is, it, it doesn't matter how much antibody you add and it does matter how much TN5 you add. Um, and those will affect your sensitivity and they'll also affect your background. Um, so it, it, there are now, this is not a brand new technology anymore. There are many, many labs that are running single cell cut and tag and multiple labs that have published data. Um, so there's lots of good information that's out there. Um, the single cell cut and tag protocol um, from the Hennikoff lab is, is on protocols.io. Um, our single cell cut and tag pro protocol is also on protocols.io. So hopefully there's there's some information there to, to guide you in kind of these concentrations. Um, so yes, it does matter, um, but that's all experiments. You know, there's optimization. And once you optimize it, you can move forward. Okay. There's a, another question. Um, so how many histomark peaks do you see in single cell cut and tag samples per cell? How much would you expect for targeting transcription factors? Yeah. So again, this is very, very sparse data. Um, so in, in our hands and also in, in others that have looked at blood, you're, you're typically seeing less than a thousand um, peaks per cell or not peaks, uh, reads per cell. It's, it's more just kind of individual reads and then you and then you learn peaks um, uh, by combining multiple cells together, um, which is incredibly sparse. Again, if you think about the fact that the genome is, is billions of, of bases long, that's why it's so important to be able to group multiple cells from the same type together, which we can learn from the protein information. And, you know, once you have about 500 cells from the same type. Now you're starting to approximate a, a very high resolution kind of uh, bulk track, um, but but it does require that kind of pooling um, setup. Um, so uh, the transcription factors is, a, is a, also a good question. Um, there is a kind of unique challenge with working with transcription factors, and it's a, it's a bit of an experimental detail, but it's an important one. Um, the salt concentration that you use when performing single cell cut and tag is really important. Um, the Hennikoff lab showed that if you perform cut and tag in low salt conditions, what winds up happening is you get a lot of background TN5 binding. And so you basically just get like a tax seek like data, which is not very useful. If you're measuring, you know, H3K27 and me 3 and you see a bunch of accessible regions, that, that's, not, that's not really an accurate data type. But that can happen if you perform cut and tag in low salt. You can perform cut and tag in high salt to get around that problem and to prevent background binding. And so that's what many groups, including ours, have done. The problem with performing cut and tag in high salt is that inhibits the transcription factor DNA interaction, which makes it very difficult to profile transcription factors in, in single cells. So we actually performed uh, Paul 2 cut and tag profiling. And that data is in the paper, but it's extremely smart, less than 100. Um, uh, reads per cell, which is not really particularly useful. We've put it in there just to, you know, just to, I, I really, in some ways, just to highlight how difficult it was. Um, so that that requires kind of, you know, additional experimental modifications and the things that we're thinking a lot about. But um, uh, it's it's not, it's, it is a slightly different protocol that would be needed for, for transcription factors, at least at single cell resolution. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a related question so when you do um single cell chrome hmm um and you say you're annotating it um like each cell individually so how are you handling the sparsity um issues there and i guess more technically like how what exactly are you binarizing yeah, so I, I I skipped over all of that for for time here, which was maybe <laughs> given given the audience, I could have gone into more detail. Um, so uh, what when when we integrate all the um, all the data sets together, uh, we can transfer information readily from one data set to the next. So what I showed you mostly was transferring cell labels. We can transfer uh, like a cell annotation um, from a reference to a query, but we can also transfer continuous measurements. Um, so what we can do is we can transfer for, even though we don't measure all of the histone modifications together in the same cell. We can transfer information so we can pretend that we measure all the histone modifications together in the same sample, which is of course essential for, for running uh, uh, Chrome HMM, right? We have to measure, or at least uh, at least have measurements um, for all of the different uh, marks together in, in, in the same uh, sample. Um, so when we do that, um, that transfer, that interpolation, it is a, there is extensive smoothing that goes um, into that process. And so that smoothing is um, a great way of being able to overcome these sparsity issues because we're essentially, we're averaging the related profiles for hundreds of similar cells together um, and being able to make those interpolated measurements. So in the manuscript, we go through quite a lot of QC, how accurate are our, our, our interpolations. Um, and what we find is those interpolations are very highly accurate when we are working with 
uh, at least cells of medium abundance. If you have very rare populations, you know, if you only have 20 or 30 cells from a given population, we don't have enough cells to be able to construct accurate pseudoblock profiles. We don't have enough cells to be able to do accurate smoothing. But if you have cells that are that are more abundant populations, which is what we focus on, um, that, that becomes quite feasible and in fact, extremely accurate. So once we interpolate those values, those are the interpolated values that we binarize and then push, uh, push through the, um, the forward backward algorithm uh, for annotation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess a related question. I mean, since you're sort of interpolating across cells, so you're no longer preserving the individual cell information, how much do you gain by sort of preserving every um, cell? Or like, an, I guess, related question. Um, I mean, to me, it seems like it might get a little unwieldy having um, to give an annotation to two every 200 base pairs for every cell, especially as these data sets get even larger? Is there a sort of a systematic way to sort of figure out um, at what point you're still gaining additional information by um, uh, doing each cell versus if you um, reduce the number of cells that you provide a chromatinum annotation for? It's a, it's a great point. So, you know, and, and there's a lot of, you know, so it was effectively we're always we're always combining information across cells, right? Because we have to, and and that that's not going you know that that will I think be true for a long time for these chromatin based measurements. We're always going to be ha having sparse data, or at least sparser than we need to be. Um, so, so the question is, do we want to combine them in a discrete way where we combine you know cells within a given cluster all together? Or can we be more flexible in terms of the way that we do that pooling? Um, so when we're doing that pooling um, for single cell chromatin MM, uh, you know, we're, we're never requiring an explicit cluster label um, to be able to pool. We're, sim we're simply pooling sort of similar cells together. So if we're looking at a dynamic process, we don't need to assign um, particular stages. We don't need to, to annotate um, in that way. So it, it, is an, it is much more unwieldy, though. It would be a lot easier <laughs> if we just had, you know, seven clusters and these are their pseudobell profiles. And it's a good question of, like, where can we maximally gain information? When do we maximally need um, that single cell resolution? And the answer, in our opinion, really is when you have continuous processes. And it's one of the reasons why I mean, we, we show an example with, with a differentiation trajectory in the blood, but the vast majority of cells in blood are, are terminally differentiated. Where things get really exciting is to look at differentiating systems, for example, the embryo or, for example, hematopoietic stem cells. And that that is absolutely the direction that we are most enthusiastic to move into, um, is to look at, at cases where all the cells are transitioning and where it really is extremely difficult and, and you would lose information just because it's impossible to, to really take a continuous process and put it into discrete stages. That's that's where you feel the, the biggest uh, improvement is going to come from. Um, so, so it really is a question almost of, you know, in, in biology, um, where does a discrete framework do the poorest job of being able to represent um, a cellular manifold? And, and we think differentiation is, and, and really cellular transitions in general is, is probably the best example of that. 